we are now going to introduce our special guest, 703. She is a friend of mine. Actually, um, we got connected partly because when she was at Yale University, she invited me to give a talk at Yale. She's also a Canadian chess champion. She is a many time Olympic player for the Canadian women's team. She is an entrepreneur and now she's a venture capital investor. Um, and she talks very eloquently about how she uses chess to be such a boss in so many areas, which is a big part about what we do at US Chess Women. So I'm super excited that you were able to make some time to, to talk to us. And in fact, I think she was just in a venture capital meeting like five minutes before this. So hope it went well. Thank you, Jen. Uh, it's it's so awesome to be here and to be surrounded by so many women and girls who are excited about chess. Um, nothing makes me happier, honestly, to see you know more females play this game. Just because you know, as we all know, it's it's so rare um, to find other kinds of us. So thank you, Jen, for hosting this and inviting me. I'm I'm so excited to meet all of you and share my story. Um, so how I want to spend the next hour with all of you is maybe spend the first 10 minutes or so telling you a little bit about my background, um, how I got to where I am today and my, my chess journey from when I was a kid um, growing up in Canada to now in the U.S. And then we're going to go through a game. Uh, so this is one of my um, I, I haven't had that many remarkable games in my life, but this is one that I will probably one day if I print a game and post it on my wall. It's this one. It was my game against um, world champion Maria Muzicic, one of the top female chess players in the world, when I played her at the 2015 Women's World Championship match uh, in Sochi, Russia. So we'll talk about that. We'll get some good chess in. Jen has prepared some awesome polls for you guys to be um, a part of. And so we'll do that. And then the last 15 minutes, I just want to save some time for you guys to ask me questions. You know, we'll do like a Reddit MIA session. You can ask me anything um, about chess, about life, uh, whatever is on your mind. I'm a total open book and I, um, I, I love kind of sharing stories. So if that sounds good, we can get started. Um, my story began when I was seven. Our family had moved to Canada when I was five. So two years later, my dad uh, was asked to kind of teach chess at a summer chess camp. And so he had played a bit in China and, uh, and thought, you know, why not? This would be a fun thing. I didn't like chess back then. I, I was signed up for art and for dance classes. So that was my first love. But then some of my friends, you know, really got into the chess class. I was like, oh, this, this could be kind of fun. Let me, let me try it out. So I tried it out. My dad was teaching in the front and I, who knew, just like I fell in love with the game. So for the next many years, so I'm now 26, it's almost 20 years since I first started playing. Um, chess has been a huge part of my life. And I would say without it, I definitely wouldn't be able to become the person I am today. So when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time on the game. Um, if you can believe it, I would go to school and then after school, I would spend on average of five hours a day training on all kinds of things. You know, I loved puzzles. I, I would wake up in the morning and just do puzzles on my own because I loved figuring things out, you know, and um, and so I love tactics. It's it's the reason why I play chess. If someone told me I couldn't play Sicilian for the rest of my life, I probably would quit chess. So I spent a lot of hours of my youth playing chess. And as a result, you know, I believe in the 10,000 hour rule, which is, I don't think that I'm that much talented. I think Jen is really talented and is just, you know, way above average on that IQ. But I don't think I am. I think I'm just a normal average girl. Um, my, my dad has taught lots of other students for the reference, and he says that there's been many who are more talented than I am. But for me, I put in the hours. I spent five hours a day on average for many, many years, and that's how I was able to get to WIM um, when I was 14 and become the top rated female player in Canada. And I played in my first Olympiad when I was 14. It was in Germany that year. Um, and I, and I played on board two. And then the subsequent year, I was 16, I played on board one. So over my last many years, I played in four Olympiads for Canada and the one women's world championship match. Um, and it's just been an, an, an incredible, incredible journey. But I think what's more important to me is less so about chess. Chess has helped me develop a lot of life skills over the years. And this is what I want to share with you guys. It's, it's not like 
you know, any chess opening tips I have because Jen has all of that for you. But for me, it's more of like, what did I learn from chess over these years that I'm able to apply to my life? So when I went to, uh, when I graduated from high school, I went to Yale uh, University, studied economics. Um, and then after that, I got a job on Wall Street um, being a financial analyst at a, um, a large investment firm called Blackstone. And so I did that for three years. Um, and, and that job was a lot of just analyzing numbers and running models on companies. Should we invest in this company? Why or why not? And so I did that for three years. And then the last two years, I've been an investor in venture capital. So venture capital is the industry where we invest in early startups. So companies that are brand new, um, you know, most of you guys don't haven't heard of, but they're doing something that's very innovative and exciting. And there's a lot of risk in those companies because a lot of them fail. So that's what I've been doing the last two years as an investor and in, in venture, and which is why I'm now on the West Coast based out of Silicon Valley, um, kind of in the heart of innovation. So what did chess kind of give me all these years to equip me for this career path? And it boils down to a few things. Number one, I talked about this earlier. I believe in the 10,000 hour rule. And I think that applies to everything. So chess has taught me that it works because if you put in the hours, you get your results. Right? It's not the hours where you're sitting there and snacking, but you're putting in real hours. So I believe in practice makes perfect and experience and time matters. So for me as an investor in early days when I first graduated university, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. And I was I was making mistakes all the time. Um, and, you know, people around me were, were looking at me and saying, how how do you make all these mistakes? And you just have to, like, kind of channel your inner chest strength where after you lose a game, you come back and you keep playing and you try again and you do it again and again. You do it 100 times the same exact model and you're going to perfect it. And so same thing with investing is like you meet companies, you have to go talk to them right? One-on-one. -on -one. Like, how do you get over that fear? How do you ask them the right questions? You do it again and again. So that's number one, is the 10,000 hour rule. To become an expert in anything, you must put in the time. Number two is that chess helped me develop a sense of pattern recognition. So it's the idea that once I've seen something many times, you start to get it, right? It's like once you've played the Sicilian, the dragon, you know, 100 times, you know those lines by heart. You don't need anyone to tell you. Once you've seen a really complex tactic combination, a fork plus pin or whatever, you can play it again on the board. So for me in investing, it's all about pattern recognition. How do we know if this is a good company to invest in that's going to become a really, really large company and will make, you know, lots of money for the company, but also for us, is because we've seen it being done before. You know, there's a similar company that's went through a similar journey and, and had very similar characteristics as this one. But how do you know about these companies? Well, it's time, right? It's, it's playing that dragon variation for 10 games, seeing some wins, seeing some losses, and figuring out for yourself which ones lead to win. So that's number two, pattern recognition. And number three, I think is also really important, is scenario analysis. I'm sure all of you do this every day when you play chess. When you're in the middle of a position, okay, you have three choices, right? And, and the more you spend time on chess, you know that the more you have to think deeply about each move. If I make this move, what will my opponent do? And the difference between a master, not master, is how many moves they can think ahead. So in my job, I do a lot of this too. So I think, okay, if we make this investment, right, what's going to happen? There are three possibilities, okay? In the next year, three things can happen. This company can do what we think they will do because of this, this, this. They will fail our expectations or they'll be somewhere in between. What is the impact of each of these scenarios to us, right? And you, so the more you've thought about that, the more you can make a better decision before you even do anything. So it's the idea of planning ahead, right? And then lastly, I think this is, um, this is a, 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 an attribute that I think will help you in no matter what you do in life. It doesn't have to be investing, it doesn't have to be finance related, but it's the idea of being resilient. This is the biggest and most important skill that chess has taught me over the years. 
-hmm. is being okay with failure because you know that you're going to go play again and that at some point you're going to win again, right? All of you have played so many games, lost so many games, but you still go back to it because you know that you can still win again. You're never going to lose forever. But a lot of people give up. Yes, <laughs> never give up. A lot of people give up because it's tough. It's tough when you go through a tournament and you lose five games in a row. No one wants to be in that situation, right? But the people who can go back and play round six, round seven, round eight, those are the people who in the long run, you develop a shield for yourself. You're not afraid of anything that could happen to you. When you apply to colleges and you get rejected, which I did plenty of times, believe it or not, you know, you think it's okay, I'm gonna keep trying. You apply to scholarships, the same thing. You apply to jobs. You know how many companies said no to me when I interviewed? You tell them I'm a chess master. I'm like, really good. I promise I can learn fast. No, the world doesn't always work that way, no matter who you are. And you have to be okay with that. And you have to be strong when you hear a no and just keep going because you have the confidence that you can do it someday. So that's the biggest life lesson. And I think chess helps you develop that every single day. And so with all of that, the last thing I would say is um, before we go into the game, it's been kind of a little bit serendipitous, maybe a little bit not, that every job I've had since I graduated college, internships and full-time jobs, I've done three internships, two full-time jobs now, and all of them had some involvement with chess. So I did an internship in a London-based um, hedge fund, like in the UK. And, um, and chess was one of the reasons why they were really excited to hire me is because they have an annual chess tournament at, in, in, um, in the company. And the company was 20 people, you know, but every year they do a casual chess tournament. And they're like, wow, like this girl can, you know, play chess really well. She must be really smart. And then when I started my first time, my, my first full-time job in New York, in Wall Street, the head of our group, my group, his son, plays competitive chess. So he knows all the, the, the chess folks in, 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 in the world. And, and that was super helpful because having someone who's very senior in leadership, who understands what you do and supports you in your career is so important. And that helped me, you know, be very successful there for the first three years I was there is because of him. And now in my current job um, in San Francisco, we have one of our partners who's Russian. And we joke that because he's Russian, it's in his blood to, to know how to play chess. But he actually is a, he actually plays chess quite well. He's around maybe 1600 in rating. And I had like no idea. But he, um, uh, he, he plays chess. He plays blitz. His kids learn um, on the side. And how I got this job was actually because of a friend of mine who I met in college when we were playing the, the inter-college chess leagues. He was a chess player from Princeton and I was at Yale. And so we would, you know, have matches against each other. And I met him a long time ago. And he was also a venture capital investor at this company. So he was the one who introduced me to this, this company. And that's how I got my job was because of him. And it was because of chess at the end of the day. So for me, I've been, I've been so, so fortunate that not only has chess helped me develop a lot of skills in life that helps me become a better um, investor, but it has also opened a lot of doors and opportunities on how I'm able to actually get here. So with that said, let's, uh, let's get into some of the, the actual fun. Um, instead of hearing me just talk about my life, let's look at a game. So as I mentioned earlier, this was my game back in 2015 at the Women's World Championship match in Sochi, Russia. This is one of the few knockout tournaments in the world. So if you if you uh, if you win, you continue on. If you lose, you you go home, right? Pack your bags and go home. Um, so the way that this tournament works, um, it, just a fun fact, is that it, there are 64 women who gets invited to this tournament from different countries, and they rank you by your rating. So number one is like the highest rated player, right? And number 64 is the lowest rated. So guess which like rank I was? I was like 58, something like that. 
not quite 60s, but I was like bottom, you know, bottom 10 for sure. Um, and, and so the way the pairings work is that one, number one gets paired with number 64, two gets 63. So because I was like 50 something, I got paired with number eight ranked at the time, Maria Muzichuk, who was like 300 FIDE points higher than me. And um, she was one of the, the top female players in the world at the time um, from, from Ukraine. So I went into this game and I'll tell you one other thing about me, which is after all these years of playing chess, what I love the most is playing someone better than me because there's no pressure, right? Like you're playing someone higher rated than you. If you win, like that's awesome, right? If you lose, that's okay. You learn something from someone who's stronger than you. You know, normally you have to pay money to play, but, um, and this was just such a great opportunity. So I never, never, ever, ever am afraid to play someone higher rated. I'm only excited by it. And I, it's only a challenge for me. So I went into this game thinking, oh, you know what? Like, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to give her a real challenge. So I was white and, um, and she played the Karakan. Um, so you guys are all pr probably pretty familiar with um, this type of setup. There's a lot of different responses here. Oh, here, here's the poll. There's a lot of different possibilities and, and it's so early on, there's no wrong answer. It's uh, sometimes just a, it's a style preference. But, you know, I didn't think F3 would get any votes. So I had the, 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 I put the fantasy variation. It's a social experiment. I thought that might Believe help. Believe it or bit. not, Jen, I actually played a few games of raid games with the fantasy because I, I, I thought it was super sharp and throw people off. I played a few games like this. Yeah, F3 is really a move here. And, and like, what's like the elevator pitch for F3? Like, why would white play that move? Yeah, if you play F3, I think the idea is to really go for a sharp um kind of king side uh, attack while you go castle queen side so the setup is usually oh, okay. you know, bishop e3 knight to c3 queen d2 castle queen side and then you go for the you know the pawn storm right away which is kind of my style <laughs> at the end ambitious. of the day it's ambitious <laughs> that's right you got a lot you're, yeah. you're, you're taking a lot of moves and not giving black any <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so we can i mean this this is a whole variation there's yeah. you know black typically plays this and there's a line where they play e5 and you have to know what to do um, because now block is coming with queen h4 um, and and that could be could be really, really uh, dangerous, right? Like if, if we take the pawn here, there's kind of a sneaky little attack check on the diagonal. If we block, oh dear, queen takes e4 and I can resign. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the easiest opening to play, but it, it could be, it could be really fun. So back to the actual game. Um, all right, so the highest vote was for knight c3. Um, and I kind of, yeah, went with the popular vote, knight c3 in this position. Um, okay, then, so uh, the main line, black takes my pawn, take it back. And then you have knight f6. So another main line in this, in the Karakhan is, Black could play um, bishop to f5, right? And you, you guys probably seen this. There's knight g3, bishop comes back, and then there's a little bit of a fun, like I'm gonna trap your bishop move, but but if you know what to do, you you kind of prevent me from doing that. And so the, there's this whole line that that goes down like that. But we're not gonna go into opening theory today. Again, I will let Jen cover that. But this game, uh, Maria played knight f6. We exchange knights, developed my knight, very normal, just trying to get my pieces out. Black developed their bishop, ready for castling. I did the same thing. Castle, castle. Okay, now we're all safe. Okay, uh, so life, life is good. Um, and I feel pretty good here in this, in this position. Um, you know, I have my bishops kind of aiming at this nice diagonal. Black has a double pawn in this position, um, which you know actually is, is quite a nice defensive pawn, even though it is a double pawn, because it, it prevents my my knight from doing anything like like this. Right? Or, what, sorry, black plays. Yeah, black plays bishop g4. But in these kind of positions, 
it's very easy if, if you could go knight g5, right? And then try to get your queen out. It could be a very deadly attack on black's king side. And so the f6 pawn here actually has some protective uh, uses. Okay, so then black plays bishop g4, pinning my knight. Um, I try to get rid of it. And they said, no, sorry, you're going to stay in this pin just to annoy you. Okay, that's okay. So my, my plan was then, I'm in this pin. I don't like it. I would like to activate my pieces, my queen, but I can't do that, right, without, n without uh, leaving my knight alone. And, and, um, and, and if they exchange, it's going to be an open king for me. So I must protect it first and then move my queen. I didn't really want to go back bishop e2 because it's a little passive. Um, and I really like this bishop diagonal. So in order to keep that, I went with bishop e4. Okay. And black continues to develop. Um, and the idea of moving the knight to the, to the side here, even though it doesn't seem like the best spot for the knight, is to bring it back to c7 eventually. And then maybe to come to e6. So that's a nice kind of little path versus if black had chosen knight d7, which might seem more intuitive, right, when you first look at it, where does the knight go from here, right? This square is already occupied. And then this square, they could go here and eventually knight to d5, but I might have a, you know, a c4 kind of attack to get rid of it. So knight e6, and I continue with my plan. And so first I uh, play c3, so I have a path for my queen to, to now come out. Black plays knight d7. And then I go queen d3. Now my knight is not pinned anymore. My queen and bishop are lined up to attack the king. And I have a very nice, what I think, pot structure right here. And so with the game continues, and black plays bishop to g6 and trying to cut off my diagonal. And so we traded and black took back with the H pawn. Now, how many times have you guys seen this little structure where there's four pawns? This is like a Rubik's cube structure. Pretty special, right? Okay, so why did, why did black make this decision and not take with this pawn, right? Probably most people think I'd rather do that. I only have one double pawn. If I do this, I have two. And it's it's kind of you know weakening maybe my king's like h file over here. Okay. So there's a reason why black did this, and you will see in the next couple of moves black's plan. So we'll get there in a second. Now I my plan was to um, develop my bishop now, and I want to put this bishop on a long diagonal because the king is king is over here, right? I, I want to go for maybe some point b3, bishop b2, c4, and then d5, and, and really activate this, this bishop on the long diagonal. So that was my plan. So I played c4 first. Um, Black developed the queen so the rooks can connect and can eventually play rook e8 in the future. Oh, and I realized, OK, maybe, you know, the 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 b the b pawn bishop move there was a little bit too slow, so actually I'm just going to strengthen my center instead. Okay, now you start to see why Black chose to recapture with the h pawn. Black played g5, and the the reason for this is they're going to start attacking my king with their own pawns, and g4 is coming. Right, with, with the queen protecting the pawn here, it's going to start breaking open my own pawn defense on the king's side. So that's the real idea of why she took on the, the h pawn instead. Okay, not, not too much to, to do to prevent g4, other than I thought maybe I should move my, my, knight, um, my knight back so it's not immediately attacked, and maybe reposition my knight. Um, in the future, maybe to square like e4, where it's more in the center and, and um, has more flexibility. 
so black continue their plan and and here i kind of had to take because if i don't take and if i decide to move my pawn up oh you no know, black can can try to continue maybe opening up my king right and, and now my pawns are going to be completely cut off from each other if i recapture here Black captures here, uh oh, this pawn does not look happy at all. And then the queen is going to start coming in. And then I, 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 I might be in a lot of trouble very, very soon. All right. So that wasn't something I wanted. So I had to capture back. The queen took. And, and now I reposition my knight to center. This, this bishop is, is going to have to find a spot to go. All right. So. So Maria moved the bishop back. And then I, I moved the knight here because if I didn't do that, black has a really annoying threat coming up, which is, let's just say I played a move like, uh, you know, rook d1, for example, right? it just seems kind of normal. But black's threat is gonna be really bad if, if she can play f5, right? And then I, I start to move my knight away, Let's say I move my knight here. F4 then comes in. And now my knight, my bishop is under attack. And where do I move this? Move this back. And, and maybe F3 is not possible here. But black has just gained so much space. And look at my pieces. They're so passive. Right? And, and she could possibly move her knight out here, knight to here, and then try to play F3. So I really didn't like like that that setup. I had to do something about this before she could start pushing her f pawn. So my my uh, my solution was okay. Before you even play f five, let me prevent that from happening. You can't play f five now because then I can just take it. So she says, okay, you're gonna stop me from playing f five. I'm still gonna try to do it. I'm gonna try to play g six and then f five. Um, and then, and then I, I got really scared of this move next. So I said, okay, why don't we just trade queens? I, I don't like how dangerous your queen is and how close it is to my king. So I want to ease off the pressure on the king side for me. So let's just trade. She refused. Probably in hindsight, she should have because I am awful at end games. Like I literally am awful at end games. I love middle games. I desperately need my queen. I only will trade it if I have to. Um, but maybe she didn't know that about me. And so she said, I, I, I'm gonna keep my queen and try to, you know, tr try to try to also fight the middle game out. So now I play my rook move to the center. I've eased off some of the, the king side concerns. I fended her queen off back, right? And so this is an interesting position. Now we're 20 moves into the game and everyone's pieces have been developed. Kings are relatively safe, but there's an open H file. So who should be worried here, black or white? Yeah, or who would you prefer playing even if, you know, or, or do you think you like white by a little, black by a little, equal, I give you all these different options. I mean, it seems like one option is is winning by a large margin, which I, I yeah, that makes sense. And we'd love to get a few opinions um, from the crowd. Um, Sharia, why don't you go first? Okay, yeah. So I was thinking I like black. Um, sorry, I like white by a little because um, white has more access to the uh, a open H file than black. So. I think that makes it a little more better for white and uh, white um, blacks pieces are still near like the around the sixth and seventh and eighth rank and mm -hmm. white pieces are more active towards like the center and they're like so they're not all the way backed off into their own area and then um, the pawns are in a nice center and it looks pretty active for white. Great. So, yeah. Great. That's, those are some great points, Sharia. Thank you. I mean, let me call on somebody else as well. Um, we've got a few people with their hands up. Lil Gen Genu, um, I, I don't think you've raised your hand in the class before, so um, would love to hear from you. 
Um, I put white by a little too, cause I think like white has a better position, and then like white can play like f3 move its king, and then have doubled rooks on the h file. Oh, is that Cicera? I feel like you're. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I recognize your voice now. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, is anybody who has their hand raised um, have a different answer than white by a little? Carissa? No, I like white. Uh, also white by a little. Anything to add to what everybody else said? I see Bernice's um, also, hand raised. <laughs> white has more protection around the king. Like uh, black's king, if they can get in, it doesn't have any protection, like any pieces protecting it. And Bernice, what were, your, what were your thoughts? Who do you like? I like quite by a lot because they have the H file and they can take over on the H file and get an attack. Okay, so we have white by a little and white by a lot. A few people who like black by a little. Um, what do you What do you think, um, Yuan Ling? Do you, I mean, I know it's been a while since you played this game, but um, yeah, I thought you honestly. Feel the time? Honestly, my um, it's been what yeah six years, so very hard for me to like remember what I was feeling the time. But I do think if I look at this position today, I would say that I personally would feel a little it is a little bit better for me. Uh, not because I'm biased and think that I'm better all the time, right? Chess is a pretty objective game, and we just look at the pieces. But I do think that here, like a lot of you 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 guys just said earlier my pieces are more active, right? A little bit more advanced than Black's pieces, which are a little bit, you know, on the seventh rank. Um, and then also what, what, I, what I really liked here was that I had a really strong center pawn dominance um, with the C4, D4 pawns. And I felt like I had a lot of space, especially with a potential pass pawn on D4 that now my rooks are getting, you know, ready to, to help launch. And so I felt there was, um, there was a lot to like here. The things that I, you know, wasn't, I was still worried, right? There, there are some potential attacks from Black that I was worried about. Um, some of it still involves their march of this pawn that could potentially come down. And, and the Black has easier access to the H file actually than White. So I know one of you mentioned that we could play F3 and, and King F2. <laughs> Maybe I should have thought of that, to be honest. Um, I, I like where you're thinking. I did not think about that at all, I promise you. But Black could easily go King G7 and Rook H8, all right? In two moves, they're on the H file. And then they can easily double their Rooks on the H file as well with Rook H7 and bring the other Rook. And, and then I, I might have to be a little worried about my own King side there. Um, so it wasn't such a clear, you know, there's no compensation for Black. White is just better. And then I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to be super confident the rest of the game. There were some things to still look out for, which made this game really, really exciting for the next 20 moves. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing about this position that dawns on me more and more is that it's like just easier to play for white. So if you have a, a player playing black who's not super strong like Maria Muzichuk, it's, it's going to be tough because it requires a delicate hand. Figuring out when to play King G8, 7 and Rook A8, 8 and when to kind of be more defensive and play Rook E8, it's, um, it's, it's not going to be easy, but it's not necessarily a terrible position. And that's yeah. like a different, a different type of chess metric, like ease of playing. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point, Jen. Um, it really depends on the, the person. And I think here it's a, um, the delicate, it's a delicate position to play for Black. But we are facing a grandmaster. So what might seem like delicate for me might be a, you know, easy breezing for her. Yeah, I mean, she did play this opening for a reason, right? Where yeah. she knows she's going to yeah. get those double pawns. So um, yeah. yeah, she yeah. didn't do that hoping to get like a quick draw. <laughs> no. Yeah, definitely had some ideas. By the way, Sushi also had this idea. Well, well put, Sushi. She also wanted to do this King G7 or K H8 thing. Um, mm -hmm. All right, well, let's see how it all panned out. Yeah, and thank you all for participating in the in the poll, um, and for you know such great answers earlier. So the game continued, and how did it? Oh. So thoroughly enough, Black starts planning the H file attack in King G seven, and. 
for now, I can't do much about it. So I'm just going to go, you know, head first with, with my plan and my attack, which was, you know, charging my, my D pawn. So play D5, we trade off pawns, and black goes knight B5. So the idea of this move is, is to really um, secure a block gate, right, on the D6 square. Um, perhaps with a knight, perhaps with a bishop, but also potentially open up you know, a, a C file if the rook ever wants to go there. The knight here, you know, might be if they don't do if they do something else, right? I might go with d6 next move. And then it would be a pin on the queen if the bishop were to take. So black had to prevent that and make sure that there was another um, attacker on d6. Okay, so I then played queen f3. Um, the main reason was because I would want it to make space for my knight to come to e4, right? We're all fighting over the d6 score now. I, I really want to make this advance, but right now I can't because black has too many pieces attacking it. So I need to bring some other pieces to help make that happen. So I played queen f3 for that reason. Black goes in with the h file. I play my knight e4. And it is not without consequences, <laughs> right? Chess is a risky game. You, you take certain risks, and, uh, and not every move is, is going to be smooth sailing for you. So my knight was there for one hot second, and, and quickly now it has to leave. And so f5 was played. Then my knight goes back. Now, the, the thing about f5, uh, from my understanding, is yes, it kicked my knight back to where I began. But it might also create some potential weaknesses for black in the long run. So if you look at this position, for black, this is a very solid defense, right? They got a nice wall here going. Um, once you open that up, now because I have a dark square bishop, uh, maybe there might be something, you know, in the in the long term that that weakens the king. So that's a trade-off. Now black. A plays bit rook h4 with the hope of doubling on the, the h file. Um, I go bishop f4, right? The same idea. I'm so stubborn. I have one idea and I want to keep doing it, which is I want to play d6 at some point. So I play bishop f4 to try to, again, make that happen. Rook h8 is played. And I realized, oh, okay, the only reason why I'm not getting checkmated is because my knight is guarding h h1. But I, I might need to prepare just in case I need to escape, right? Someone earlier, someone mentioned F3, King, F2. I can't play F3 anymore, sadly. My queen's there. So if I need to escape, I, I need to create a backup plan for myself. The rookie one was to give my king a little bit of space, but also just put it on an open yeah, E file there. Now black goes in for the exchange, bishop D6. And... I didn't want to do that because, again, I felt like I have this bishop is very powerful um, because the, the weaknesses on Black's king are all dark squares. So I felt like keeping it might be better for me. So I said, OK, I'm going to go attack the rook instead. Um, and, and she, of course, is also a super aggressive player. Uh, so she played rook g4, attacking me again, not necessarily going back, which I thought, you know, she would, but she instead played rook g4, kind of a, a little bit of a uh, an odd position for the rook, but it totally works here because it's protected by the f5 pawn. And now my bishop needs to find another home. So I go back, all the way back. And, and now remember my long-term plan, my original plan of this long diagonal, right? Now I'm like, okay, we can try that again, and I could potentially play b3 and put my bishop on b2 at some point. So something for me to keep in the back of my mind. She went for rook queen c7, attacking my knight. I have to protect it um, since there weren't that many squares to go for a knight, and I desperately need to control the, the h1 square, so rook d3. Rook h4. And I remember, I think at this point, I was starting to get a little nervous. <laughs> Why? Because Black's plan was obvious. 
Okay, well, I'm gonna come down here. The knight's not letting me come down, right? So I'm gonna go kill it with the bishop. And once I do that, then it's a it's a it's a free um, file for me to dominate. And and so, what did I do? Okay, is I went to attack the rook again. I I needed to do something in in reaction. Um, if I just sat there, I knew what was going to happen to me. Just played here again. Okay, so this is part of the, what happened here was a little bit of we were approaching 40 moves close I, I don't know exactly what move we were um it was like move 33 and i remember at this point both of us didn't have that much time right and this tournament had a time control where once you pass 40 moves you get like another extra hour or something like that but up until now it was a fixed time control plus an increment on every move and so we were really both trying to make move 40 so there's a little bit of a, a repetition here um but then she she realized another way to to come into the the h file with with the queen, and I said, okay, you know what? Well, I'm I'm gonna still try to do my long diagonal thing. My bishop's not in the best place, but oh, we'll we'll get there. I'm threatening a four to move the knight away, and then put my bishop to c three. So she goes queen h four. Now I'm really feeling the attack, right? This, uh, she's a grandmaster after all. Uh, can't expect anything less. I go for a4. Knight retreats back. I get my check in finally, right? After all this time. Okay. And then she blocks with f6. And it was a little uh, underwhelming. Like, oh, all of that just for, you know, for f6 and, and, and nothing, nothing much can be done from here on. So then I really had to figure out a plan of escape because queen was coming down to check. Pieces were going to take my knight. My, my king side was starting to really feel like it's going to be falling apart soon. So king goes to f1. Um, and, and she played a really good move, rook f4 here. Now it's, like oh, we see where your king is going, I, I'm I'm gonna start aiming at aiming at that, not letting go anywhere. So rook f4, my queen moves away, and then bishop c5. Now she's coming for the f2 pawn. Uh oh, that's really bad. With between everything and all these threats, <laughs> I feel like I could be right, like moves away from getting checkmated at this point. I need to defend. Okay, so I go rook. F3, I'm gonna block that. Um, she goes queen, g4, tries to put again more pressure um, on that, but also freeing this rook to potentially come down. Now. Okay, so everything, everything is aiming at my king. Couldn't leave me alone for a whole second. Okay, so it's this point where, remember 20, 20 moves ago or 15 moves ago, when move 20, we talked about this. And I said, one of the things I was holding on to was my, my past D pawn and my center um, control. I can't just defend for the rest of my life. I've got to do something. Right? And so this is where I think, you know, and I remember at this point we had maybe both a few moves left to make move 40. And we both had a few minutes left on the clock at this point in time. And this is probably one of the you know, the more, more important games of my life that I've played. And, and that's probably where the last, you know, uh, 15 years, at that point, I'd been playing chess for maybe 14, 15 years. Really like that experience, that, that pattern recognition, all of that, the resilience I built really played a role because under pressure, the more experience you have, the more you're not afraid of failure, the more calm you're gonna be. So, the best way to defend is to counterattack. I played d6 here. And then she took my rook. And I think we have another poll. Yes. So this is this is a, another fun position for everyone to participate in. What would you play here as white? We would love everyone to cast your vote. Even if you don't know, just pick your best answer. Nope, nobody likes d7. Mm -hmm. The one pot is one square away from promoting to a queen. Oh, 
Uh, just because I said, don't, don't vote for that just because I said it, guys. They can't, um, see, they can't see, by the way, what other people are voting for. Oh, they can't see. Oh, okay, okay. Which is really good because it means that people don't, you know, ah, influence okay. by what other people are voting for. That's um, a cool feature. It is a really cool feature. Yeah, because otherwise, I think a lot of times people will go with the majority vote. But it means that in this case, for instance, with many people um, coming up with the move that you played, they all came up with it themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. We have a lot of uh, future champions in this room. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> champions of chess or champions of life, like, yeah. like you. Yeah. Like Everyone you. is a champion of life. We don't wow. have to be champions of chess. We are all champions of life. Yeah, well, being alive, that, that's a good start. That's a good start. You can still, still got to work at it, though, right? Yeah. Um, any, anyone want to say what they would do here? We probably won't take as many comments here because it's a little bit more tactical oriented rather than like opinion slash strategic based. Um, Bernice, what did you want to play? I wanted to play with G7. Check. Cool. Cool. Um, anybody who hasn't spoken yet today want to tell us what they would play? I think we have a lot of people who had their hands up earlier. Just sushi. Anything to add? Sushi, oh, am I pronouncing your name right? Yeah, Suchi. Beautiful. So I was initially, like, my first thought was to uh, go G captures F3, but I picked queen ca captures F3 instead because I was thinking maybe, like, the queen would go to H3 and then check, and if I were to move king to E2, then the rook would go over to E8 and then check over there. Great. Would well, you want to tell us uh, what happened in the game, you mind me? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm so excited because uh, of the maybe like 35, 40 people who voted in this poll, majority had picked the winning move. So if all of you guys play against the, the world champion someday, you're going to win. Um, Rook E7 was the, the move. That was the move that totally tipped the game in my favor. Um, and it was so exciting because if you guys see the the actual um, the board, uh, the moves, right? This is move 41. So we had just completed 40 moves and this was the first move after where I got some time to think um, and, and made the right one. But this is an example of how you can turn a situation that you think, like at the time, like I thought I was totally dead, half, half dead, right? Like all her rooks, queens, whatever was pointing at my king. I was feeling like the pressure was gonna, you know, tear my king side apart. But if you counterattack and if you stay calm and you, again, don't be afraid of failure, you can turn situations around. And doesn't matter who it is, grandmaster, world champion, it really doesn't matter. It, it comes down to you. So. Like people said, king f8 is not a great solution. I mean, it's not a great square for the king, right? Um, and so now I take the rook back. And, and the real idea of, of rook e7 now shows itself, which is my king is able to hide behind my rook. Whereas if I had taken, go back a few moves, if I had taken the rook immediately, right, the, the problem would have been um, there could have been checks in which if my king comes up, Rook e8 could have attacked my king, right? And, and this would be a lot more complicated where if I move my king here, now there's, nobody's protecting this pawn. Right? And then this pawn is gonna have to go. So that was my only hope in this game. And I had to make sure I protected it. So rook e7 was the only way to, to make sure that happened. Um, and then I took the rook back, checked e7, and now black is under the threat of me capturing the knight right here and then promoting you know to a pawn uh, to a queen here or sorry rook capturing the knight as well um there's also bishop takes on on f6 like all of a sudden wow like you know i'm attacking here right and, and black's pieces are not that coordinated and this bishop on this diagonal is finally becoming useful 
So she, instead of trying to defend her pieces, goes in for another counterattack, right? Uh, tries to go after my f2 pawn, queen g2. I protect it with my bishop, b1. Now it's time to really move the knight or else I'm going to capture it, knight e8. And then for the final strike, queen d5, threatens f7 mate. And uh, it's it's kind of hard to defend. Black has to take the pawn at d6, but that is okay because queen e7 and I'm threatening queen takes f6. And there's no way to protect it if if she had played bishop d4, then I have queen takes d6 followed by queen d8 mate next, or you know move the rook in discovery attack, and there's a mate somewhere in the next couple of moves. Uh, so there you have it, ladies. Um, the the uh, the only time I I played and won against a world champion, um, starting with what I thought was you know a pretty terrible situation for me um, just a few moves before we made time control, but eventually being able to turn it around, turn a, a potential loss into a win. Um, so why I want to show this game is because, not just because of the, the win against um, a high profile player, but more so the idea that you can start from a low starting point. You could, you could start off whatever situation not like you wanted it to be. And you can still turn it around, not just in chess, but in anything you do. It's, it's not always 100% a linear kind of, you know, you're doing well, you're doing well, you're doing well, and then you succeed. Sometimes you are not doing well along the journey and you have to keep at it and you have to be resilient and you have to be fearless. So thank you all for participating. Um, I know it's like, 7.55 on the East Coast right now. I, I promise to save everyone some time for, for question and answer. Um, so, we're, so let's do that for the next 10 minutes. I don't want it to be too late um, on, on the East Coast for you guys. So let's open it up to q and I'm happy to answer any any questions, chess, life, whatever whatever you want to ask me. Thank you, Yuan Ling. We got some questions coming up. By the way, I love Queen E6. That's a bomb move. Um, it, we call it a creepy move, uh, and uh, I, I, I use that in one of my previous classes, creeping move, when the queen just moves that one little square, mm -hmm. and Liliana calls it creepy move, because <laughs> it sounds kind of the same. I, I think I think that's actually better. It's a, it's a creepy move. It's, it's creepy to the opponent, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, let's take some questions. Um, Violet, what's your question? Um, my question is about how you stay like disciplined and like focused when you're doing some type of like chess training. A lot of times for me, it's really hard for me to like just stay focused and like be putting in like my full effort the entire time. Yep. Um, that's a really good question. I think for me growing up, part of it was because I loved the game. Like I truly did. And which is why today I still, you know, I still um, try to get involved. I, I have a few little girls that I teach myself. Um, but it, for me, it was fun. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a chore, nor, nor was it something my parents demanded me to do. And I think that has to be the foundation of why you do something is because you really, really want to do it. Not because anyone else wants you to. And if that's the case, you will find yourself being able to do it for hours. And at the end of the day, you realize, oh, you know, like, I can't believe it's been hours because I enjoy it so much. Right. You know, the feeling of like, when you're, I don't know, playing your fate. I don't know if you guys play video games or if you watch your shows that you like, you just watch it for hours, you play for hours and you don't think time has gone by because you really love it. And so, so I would, so that was number one. And then number two is um, in order to stay focused, I think it, it's important to maybe come up with a schedule for yourself. I loved creating schedules for myself when I was a kid. I would put up a little piece of paper and I would say, today I'm going to, wake up at this time. I'm going to do this and this from this time. I'm going to do this and this and eat lunch at this time. I love doing that. It's not for everyone. I still do that today. Um, but one thing you can tell yourself is, okay, I'm going to do chess for an hour, like this time to this time. And then after that, I'm going to go do something else. All right. I'm just going to set myself a timer. I'm going to put my phone away, put everything away. And I'm just going to focus for this one hour and that's it. So you know that there's a time control for yourself and it's not like forever, 
right? And you can you can try to do as much as you can in that hour. Other All right, great. Yeah, great question. London, what's your question? How did you feel on playing your first chess tournament? How did I feel when I played my first chess tournament? <laughs> this was maybe 20 years ago. Oh dear. Um gosh, I don't know. I I I would be, it wouldn't be, a, I would probably be making something up right now if you ask me this question, because I cannot remember how I felt when I was seven. It's been 20 years. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, when I play in tournaments now, it is a combination of both excitement, but also a little bit nervousness, to be honest, because excitement, because I love chess and it's so much fun and I enjoy the games nervousness because now I don't spend much time on training the game. So I know that I'm not able to play at my peak anymore um, because I've dedicated so much of my life now to my career. And so chess to me is more of a, of a decide hobby. So when I play competitively, I'm a little just nervous thinking that I might not be able to play in my highest level, but that doesn't stop me from playing. I like it so much. Love it. Um, let's see, Erica, what's your question? Yeah, I was, um, I was wondering how you use your kind of chess knowledge to incorporate it into, uh, into what's you chose to major in economics, right? I'm actually, mm -hmm. I also committed to, to majoring in economics. So I was wondering how you, uh, first of all, like how you kind of use that to, uh, I guess in university applications, I wonder how you incorporated it because I can I can kind of tell that maybe we give off some kind of different vibes here because I'm kind of I'm not as disciplined. I just like to play however, you know, however I'm feeling and just go through like what's kind of like muscle memory for me. Um, I'm very instinctual. And then, you know, beyond that, that's how you might use it to uh, to stay disciplined in your career. Yeah, I would say I'm also very uh, instinctual these days, especially because I don't train. Right. I don't have any opening like knowledge anymore. Like literally, um, I just kind of play based on what I think is what I think is good. I think what it relates, how it relates to my major was at the end of the day, economics is a type of um, it's, it's a quantitative field, right? You're doing analysis on um, on the economy at large or on, at the business level. And so I think chess gives you the quantitative framework for how you think about things. And that is probably the similarity with economics is you want to think about things in a in a formulaic way. Um, unlike, you know, some other things like literature, right? Literature is, is not formulaic. It's not like you do A plus B equals C and you can create a beautiful novel and <laughs> not necessarily like that. You need to be a lot more creative and expressive. I think economics or any of the sciences, computer science, math, all of those fields are more quantitative in nature. And for me, just more relatable because, you know, growing up playing chess, you know, all of you know, it's, it's, it's more like math, right? Than like English. Yeah, that is that is true. I like to um sometimes you know I consider whether or not I chose kind of like the right field because I was always very bad in math, but I like to be creative on the creative on the chessboard and kind of just play things that maybe don't really work. But um yeah, I mean I was actually recommended to study like the games of Botvinnik and uh and you know people like that because I thought I needed like more strategy, but I was always more drawn to somebody like tall. You just do something crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me yeah. too. It doesn't really work, but it looks cool. So, right, yeah, thank totally. You. Thank you. Of course. Amazing questions from Erica. Um, we have a couple of questions, I think, about your start in chess from Rosanna and also, I believe, from Siri. Um, Siri, do you want to um, give your version of the question and then I'll find Rosanna's and then um, maybe you on link can uh, answer them both at the same time? Sure. Um, I wanted to ask, like, so when did you start learning chess and who taught you um, chess? Like, yeah, yeah, I started when I was seven. Um, and then my dad was the one who taught me. Um, he, he was the one who was teaching it, teaching the game at a chess camp. And, and I uh, stumbled upon his class and learned it from him. That's really nice. And also, I have another question up really quickly. Um, do you have any siblings that, uh, or um, that if you have siblings, do you play against them? I um, I don't know. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have any siblings. I'm an only oh, child. 
Um, um, so I didn't really play against them growing up. I think I always maybe played against my dad or played online. Oh, okay. Nice. And R Rosanna, you, you are also an only child. Was that the hand symbol? Yeah. Um, I play against my mom and I'm an only child. Um, and my question was, what made you interested in chess in the beginning? Yeah, that's a really good question. I didn't really talk about that. I think I got interested into it because I've always, even before I started playing chess, I've always been interested in puzzles and logic. This is why when I started playing chess, I loved solving tactics, just like all kinds of tactics. And I could immerse myself in them for hours. Um, so I loved puzzles. I loved, you know, Lego. I loved things that puts gets put together, figuring out little mazes, whatever it was. Um, and and so I, I felt like chess was just an extension of that. You know, it wasn't like Monopoly where there was some chess, there was some luck to it. Uh, chess is something where you pretty much have full control over it, right? And win or loss, it's it's pretty much all on you. Um, and you can also very much learn from your mistakes easily. You can't say, oh, I lost this game because I got so unlucky, right? You can't blame it to the dice or anything. You, you have to look back at your mistakes and learn. So every game I've played, even if I lose, I feel like it's a win for me because I'm learning and I'm getting better. I love that. By the way, I just want to give a shout out to um, Bernice because she's from Kenya. So it's like the middle of the night there. What is your question? My question is what tournament did you, what tournament was that that you're playing? What, which tournament, sorry, say that again. What, which tournament? From the game that she showed? Yes. Ah, yes. It was the 2015 Women's World Chess Championship, um, I guess, tournament. It, it's a 64-player it's a knockout tournament, and it happens every two years for both men and for women. And, um, and basically, the winner of that is the, the women's world champion. The winner of the men's section is the, the kind of the, uh, I guess, the, the world champion on that side. So... The open section. Ever since yeah. Susan Polgar, it was renamed. Yes, the that's true. Section. Yeah. <laughs> open section. Men and women are both welcomed. Yes. And then women in, in the are only welcome in the women's section. Um, so uh, I. Thank you. Yes, Bernie, it's a great question. Um, because who won the tournament in the end, by the way? That, that yeah, was my opponent who won yes. the tournament. Uh, Maria Muzicek ended up to, uh, winning the tournament because the format of the, the 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 match is you get paired with someone, you play two games against them. So I played two games against her. I won the first one. I lost the second one. So we went to tie break. And then tie break, she won tie break because she won one game and we drew one game. So she went on to advance in the tournament and I packed my bags and went back to Canada. And so in the very end, because it's elimination, right? After many rounds of elimination, she actually won the whole thing at the end. So she became world champion <laughs> after that tournament. Wow. Like, so you basically affected the destiny because, you know, by playing so well in the, in the first round, you probably actually helped her. I mean, a lot of times I feel like having a tough round one, it puts you in the fighting mood, you know, that a lot of strong players have told me that. So yeah, uh, even though you didn't win, you you definitely um, changed the trajectory. And she's so nice. She and her sister Anna are both like very very strong yeah, players. Yeah, yeah so for it's, sure. It's, it's almost time to go, guys. We might have time for maybe like one more question. I had one from anonymously um, from somebody asked what to do when you feel stuck in life and chess, and then maybe we'll take one more and, and wrap it up. That's a deep question. <laughs> Okay. Um, what do you do when you feel stuck in life in chess? Okay. Whew. Um, I think the answer to, to both those things is, is fairly similar. How I approach life, how I approach chess when I don't feel like I'm progressing is similar. And really it is for me, the way I like to approach it is I like to do a self analysis of my, myself and just like what my strength and weaknesses are. And um, and so for chess, it's very easy, right? If, you, if you're if you working with a coach, um, maybe that person could help you identify those things. If you are working by yourself, um, you might need to think more deeply. It's like, what, what are my biggest weaknesses, right? Where do I need to improve? And so once you've narrowed in on those specific things, then you know how to target your training and where you spend time on to improve your weaknesses. So that that's kind of how I approach it. And I, like I said, in the very beginning, 
my philosophy in life is a 10,000 hour rule. I do not believe that if each and every one of you spend 10,000 hours on this game, you're not going to become close to a master. Like I would bet that all of you would, because it doesn't take a super talented person. It takes a really hardworking person. So same thing with life, right? If I feel stuck in my career, I'm not moving forward. Then I go ask the people around me, the people at my company who've been there for 10, 15 years, who are much more seasoned investor than me, like my boss, right? Been doing this for 20 more years than I have. They're way more experienced. I ask them, what do I need to do to improve at investing? How can I become a better employee to you? And you ask for feedback. And that's the biggest thing. It's like not being afraid to acknowledge your weaknesses and what you need to work on, because that's the only way we can keep moving forward in life. That's very difficult. Wow, that's great advice. Great advice. Um, Marissa, we're going to take one more question for Marissa. And then I, I actually have a, one thing I want to ask you before we wrap up. Marissa? Yeah, thanks. Um, so hi, I was wondering, um, what influenced your decision to attend Yale? And do you have like a highlight from your time there? Um, also, great question. What, what made me want to go to Yale? Um, if you, if you uh, go on Google or YouTube and you look up, um, you type in in the search bar, uh, why I chose Yale or something like that's why I chose Yale. There's a video made about this. And there's a video, it's like 10 minute video that shows you life on campus. And it's made by students of why they chose Yale. And so that video, honestly, I know it was for marketing, but it really got to me because it just made me feel like this campus is just so vibrant, right? The people are so happy there. They, they love learning, but they also love doing everything else that's part of college life. Um, and so that was the biggest reason. And then highlight of my experience, so many. I mean, when Jen came down and we were hosting the, um, I was um, co-president of the Yale Poker Club. Um, I had asked her to come down and, and do a talk with our, our poker club. And, and she, you know, you know, very gratefully, like spend the time with us and played with our club, even though we are beginners, like we we're absolute beginners relative to her. Um, that was something that was really fun that I did senior year. Um, but I think more importantly, when you when you all of you go to college, especially if you go to college in the US, you're going to live on campus most of the time. And I think the most valuable thing I took away from those years, it doesn't matter if it's Yale or somewhere else, wherever you go, it's the people you meet and the friendships you make. Because some of my closest friends today are my friends from, from college, not from high school, not necessarily from, from middle school, but from college, because we lived together, we lived life together, and we're at a point in our lives where we're all thinking about similar things. And, um, and so it's those deep, 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 deep friendships that you build there that are just so, so, so valuable and that you take with you for a lifetime. Yeah, and here in the girls club, because I know it's harder to network this year in this pandemic year. So I hope that some of you guys will make friends here that you'll be friends with for a long time. Now, Yuan, Yuan Ling, I, I saw your interview with Canadian TV. I put it in the email when I sent everybody about you coming. So some of them probably watched it. But for those who didn't watch it, um, I was really, really moved by the part where you talked about why you um, kept your Chinese name and you, you use that and also what its real meaning is. So can you just like tell everybody about that? Because it's, so, it's such a great story. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked, Jen. Um, so my Chinese name, uh, the meaning of it in Chinese is actually the, the top, of ice, top of an iceberg or an ice mountain. Um, so Yuan means, so it's two parts, it's Yuan and then Ling. And then the first Yuan means kind of like first or top or something like that. And then Ling kind of represents you know, ice mountains and, um, and, uh, you know, kind of a, a snowy mountain. And so it's, it's been really fascinating because I've had this name since I was born. I, I didn't want an English name when I moved to Canada. Um, and I think it became a big part of my identity and it became a, almost a self-fulfilling destiny because when I became the top female chess in Canada, some people say like it was symbolic that my name was like the top of an ice mountain since Canada is so cold and we have so much ice and snow um, that I was able to get to the top there. Um, but also for me, you know, I, I've seen a lot of amazingly unique names in this room and people from all different cultures and, and identities. And and I think that's just incredible. Right. It's because the world is becoming increasingly connected. And especially in this country, we have people from all over the world. 
Um, and so embracing where you come from and your identity there is something to be very proud of. And for you guys, you, you all relate to this because you also all play chess, is that, you know, the more you, uh, the more you spend time playing chess and playing tournaments, people get to know you by your name, right? So for me, once I got better and better and I became more known in the Canadian chess scene, people started knowing me, my name, before they even met me. And, and that was really, really special. I think it's, it's pretty unique in chess that, you know, you, you kind of have this attachment to your name. That's not just like a, Hey, nice to meet you. I am you on laying. It's also something that other people know you by. Um, so that's, that's been really, really special for me. And, and the other fun fact is because my name is like both wise, um, I now kind of have a nickname where a lot of people call me YY, like two wise. Um, just because it kind of, it rolls off the tongue. It's, it's like kind of cute and it, it just super easy for, for people to, to remember. <laughs> and you like it as well. I like it. I like it because I, I it's, uh, it's, it makes, mm, I think for me, like that the special thing about a name is that people rem- remember you for something, right. And they know what to call you. And, um, and if the name is easier to remember and unique in that way, then it, it makes me feel like I'm able to build a stronger connection with the people I meet because I leave a stronger print in their minds. And I'm not just like an average, I don't want to like say anything bad about them, like classic American names, but like, you know, a name that there's like 500 people with. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's why I, I like YY. I also like Yuan Ling. Um, both of them are part of me. I love that. That's really beautiful. And I agree, like your name, like looking, looking for those nicknames and names that have so much deeper meaning is is so important. Wow. What a a beautiful story to end it with. Thank you so much to Yuan Ling, Yuan YY for showing us this brilliant game against Maria Musichuk and more importantly, talking to us about chess and life and business and all that it's given her. And now she's She's really giving back and we appreciate it so much. It was awesome to meet all of you and thank you all for your questions and participation today. And thanks, Jen, for having me. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you.